Stabilizers. This is a really complex subject that people avoid like the plague. So today we're gonna briefly talk about what they are, what they do, and how you use them in ice cream. Hi everybody, I'm Nick. Welcome back to Polar Ice Creamery. As we said at the start, we're gonna talk about ice cream stabilizers. Now, a stabilizer is something that has an effect on your ice cream base. The effect can be for various reasons, but the, the majority of them are to reduce ice crystal size, to reduce air bubble size, and to make your ice cream smoother, melt slower, more evenly, and to make it creamy in the mouth. So, this is just a few of the ones I've got here. I haven't got any of the commercial ones here today. But let's talk about where they come from. So people are obsessed thinking that stabilizers are an unnatural product. And I can kind of understand why, because governments have labeled them with numbers, e-numbers. Now there are a lot of unnatural products that have these labels, and that's I think why, where people are getting confused. But there is a reason for this e-number because it's an additive. It's not a direct food product, so they can't label it as what well, they can. They could call it what it is, but if you saw, um, you know, Goo Gum Locust Bean Gum in your in your food, you'd probably freak out thinking you're eating locusts, but it's not. So by giving it these e-numbers, it allows them to store a database of all the products, what they are, and then to take up less space on your ingredient label, they can just put the blah, 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 E number on it. So the, the majority of ice cream stabilizers are, like I said, natural products. They come from beans, they come from seaweed, they come from plants, they come from fruit. They come from all these kind of things. And, and what they're, they're done is they're processed in factories, dried, dehydrated, um, they, you know, they might, you might have gelatin sheets, all these kind of things. They're certainly not made up through artificial chemicals. So you can kind of forget that straight away. Or well, the ones that we're talking about here aren't. There are some that are, but the majority of the ones you're gonna use in ice cream are natural products. So we'll start with this one, ice cream stabilizer. This is a mix from straight from special ingredients. This is a really good one. If you can get, I know you can buy this on Amazon. Uh, you can buy on Amazon UK, Amazon US, Amazon Canada. So, you know, it's gonna be available most places. It is quite expensive for how much you get. And if you were to source the ingredients yourself, you'd be able to make it cheaper. But ultimately, if you wanna buy something off the shelf and use it in your ice cream at home, I'd probably start with something like this. There are other brands and other mixes of ice cream stabilizer available, but this is the one that I use. What is in this? So on the back, it's locust bean gum, which is E410, fatty acids, which is E471, guar gum, which is E412, sodium alginate, which is E401, and agar agar, which is E406. So all of those products are natural products, but they've all got that E number for regulation purposes. Don't let that scare you. Okay, so let's just talk about each individual element. Locust bean gum. What is locust bean gum? Where does it come from and what does it do? So locust bean gum, which is shortened in many places to LBG, is also known as carob bean flour and it's made from the seeds of the carob tree. This is a tree that's quite common in Mediterranean places and it's been used as thickeners in cooking for hundreds if not thousands of years. This is what a locust bean gum looks like and during its stages of processing, it comes down into a powder, just gets pumiced down into a really fine powder. Now, locust bean gum is very popular because it has one of the best ice crystal reduction capabilities. What that means is that locust bean gum will assist with the reduction of ice crystal size formation in your ice cream. So the longer your ice cream takes to churn, the larger those ice crystals can get, 
this helps with that. If you have a very cheap machine off Amazon for 20 pounds, this will really help improve the texture of your ice cream. Now, if you're also gonna let your ice cream defrost before you start serving it, what you're doing is you're melting some of those ice crystals, which makes it smoother and easier to scoop. Then when you put it back in the freezer, you're refreezing them. That process increases the size of the ice crystals. So you're, you're, you've gone through all the effort of making ice cream. It tastes really good. You take it out of the freezer, you leave it for 10 minutes to soften up so you can scoop it. You're actually having a detrimental effect on the overall texture of your ice cream doing that. So this is that's where these come in because they start to reduce that enlargement of ice crystals. The next part of this mix is fatty acids. Fatty acids, we're gonna look at silk gel. Now, silk gel is a mono and diglycerides of fatty acids, E471. On here, fatty acids, E471. So that is what is in here, silk gel. Silk gel is, you can see that, it's literally a white slash clear, it's like semi-opaque, let's call it that. It's, got, it's a semi-opaque gum. This actually, Although it is a stabilizer to a degree, it's more an emulsifier. So this will help your fats and your waters combine into a much smoother base. But they've added it in here, so in a powdered format, so that you can have a stabilized and emulsified ice cream base. Again, the emulsification makes your final result ice cream smoother. Smoother mouthfeel, smoother on the tongue. The emulsification helps to make your base more viscous. The viscosity of your base has a direct relation to the size of the air bubbles. The more viscous your ice cream base increases the shear strength as your ice cream churns. So as your ice cream is churning and getting harder and harder and harder, the viscosity increase shears the actual ice cream itself in the churning process and shrinks the size of the air bubbles. Smaller air bubbles, much like the smaller ice crystals, give you a nice smooth mouthfeel. So that's that will help with that as well. The next ingredient is guar gum. I don't have any guar gum on its own, but I have this, which is my mix in here. It's just an old tub I recycled. So this is a locust bean gum and guar gum mixture. So it's two part locust bean gum, one part guar gum. Now, guar gum, again, it's a natural ingredient. This is E412, and just so you can see here, E412, so it's the same product. Now, what is guar gum? Let's talk about that, shall we? So, guar gum is derived from a seed of the guar plant. That That is part of the legume family, so it is directly related to peanuts. Now, I don't know if you'd be allergic to guar gum if you are allergic to peanuts. That would be interesting to know. So if you are allergic to peanuts, maybe look at that first. Guar gum has been used in India for thousands of years and it's been used as a stabilizer in ice cream since the 1950s. Now guar gum doesn't reduce the ice crystal sizes as well as locust bean gum, but it adds more viscosity. Now again we're talking viscosity here like we were with the silk gel. The higher viscosity means smaller air bubbles during the churning process. So if you had just your locust bean gum, like I've done in here, if you had just your locust bean gum and your guar gum combined into one little handy tub, what you've got here is you've got the guar gum to increase the viscosity, so that will reduce your air bubble size, and you've got the locust bean gum to reduce your ice crystal size. And the battery's running out. So overall then, what you've got is a really handy little mix. You've got a handy mix that accounts for two of those elements, the viscosity, so reduced air bubble size, and the reduced ice crystal size. The next ingredient on here is sodium alginate. I don't have any of that, that comes from seaweed, but essentially it's it has a similar kind of effect as agar agar, which is used in here as well. But what that does, again, is it increases viscosity. It comes from brown ocean kelp, which is a cold water kelp itself. It dissolves in cold water, but does hydrate better around the 70 degrees centigrade mark. It's okay at keeping ice crystals small, and it does contribute to a, a better texture and body that some gums can't create. But I've never had a problem with just using gums. So if you want to avoid sodium alginate and agar-agar, then that's absolutely fine. 
But as it's in this proprietary mix, why not just use it? It's, um, again, it's, it's off the shelf. You don't have to worry about it. And the final one, agar agar. Like I said, that, that is this, I broke the tub. So what is agar agar? Agar agar is a natural vegetable gelatin counterpart. So it's good if you're vegan and you don't wanna use, you know, animal-based gelatin, you can use agar agar. You can use it in jellies as well. It's really, really good. It's a white semi-translucent when sold in packages. And it is really just a thickening agent. So if you're, if you're going to use a, an ice cream base that doesn't have a lot of body. So let's say you're looking at something with low solids content, somewhere in the, in the low 40s, thir late 30s, you might want to include something like this or Gua gum, which would increase the viscosity and give you the effect of a thicker base with higher solids. You can buy this off the shelf. You can buy it on Amazon, eBay, uh, health food shops, anywhere you like. It's available all over the place. That is all of the ingredients in there. It's it's great. Like I said, I'm not a, I'm not associated with special ingredients. I just find their products easy to buy, readily available, a little bit on the expensive side for what they are. But if you're just making ice cream at home, you don't need to go out and buy five kilos of cremadan just to to make ice cream. On to the next one, xanthan gum. Whoop, there we go, xanthan gum. Xanthan gum has the proprietary number of E415. What is it? It's actually a ferment, part fermented sugar, um, but it, it is really good on its own. It, it's a really decent stabilizer. If you don't wanna get in too much into stabilizers and you just want something that you can put in your ice cream to help with a bit of everything, I'd probably go with this. You can, it will help with uh, an increased viscosity. It's okay at dealing with ice crystal size and formulation, and it's also okay at reducing the air bubble size because of the viscosity increase. It's readily available. Like I said, it's cheap. You can buy it basically everywhere. It's in so many foods out there, it's crazy. It's probably the easiest one to get out of all of these and the, the cheapest too, I would have thought. So if you're just gonna start looking into stabilizers, xanthan gum is probably where I'd start. Now, we're moving on to these other two, gelatin and pectin. Gelatin, it's not too bad actually. Um, uh, another ice cream expert that I've spoken to for years, he started his ice cream journey using gelatin in basically all of his recipes. And I never actually got to try his ice cream. He lives on a different part of the world to me, but uh, you know, rest assured other people have, and they say it's excellent. So let, let's assume that gelatin is really good. I've used it a couple of times. Um, I find it okay to use. I prefer to, to, to use this, but it's each to our own. What does it do? It stabilizes the free water, as all of these do. They stabilize free water as well. What does that mean? Water in ice cream is what gives the ice crystals the body, is what makes it cold, is what assists with the mouthfeel. Gelatin will hold on to that free water and form a gel. Gelatin, gel, it's in the, the, the clue is in the name. And it will stop that free water creating large ice crystals. It will assist with a small ice crystal formation. So what the result is, your mouth, your tongue, feels that the ice cream is smoother and slightly warmer. Now I say warm, it's you know relative to how cold ice cream should be anyway. That is what free water does. Too much free water in an ice cream will make it really cold. And sometimes, I'm sure you've had it before, you go somewhere, you, you try some ice cream and it, and it hits your mouth and you go, oh, that really is cold. And that's because there's too much free water in that ice cream itself. Now, I was lucky enough to go to a Michelin star restaurant with um, the people that I work with and the food was just incredible. I mean, incredible. I'll put a little video up here of the final course, which was mint choc chip ice cream. This is not just any mint choc chip ice cream. Uh, hold on, let me just get my best marks and Spencer's voice going. 
This is not just any mint choc chip ice cream. This is Michelin star grade mint chocky chip ice cream. <laughs> Crap name, but look at the theatrics of it. Now, one thing that I actually said here was the ice cream was really cold. It had been taken out of the freezer to scoop into a nice little quenelle, as you can see. But when you ate the ice cream, it was really cold, way too cold. Very low in solids as well, which considering the, the quality of the rest of the food, I guess it is what it is. But that free water in that ice cream made it much colder than ice cream should be. The lower solids allowed that free water to stay open in the recipe. So as it, it may have been stabilized, but if it was, it wasn't done particularly well. So whatever that noise is. So when you put it in your mouth, we were talking, you know, a tiny little piece here of ice cream, you put it in your mouth, the instant knowledge, the instant effect was, wow, that's too cold rather than, oh, what a lovely, creamy, minty ice cream. It was just too cold. So the addition of any of these in relation to the actual ice cream recipe itself would have made it last a little bit longer rather than melt so incredibly quickly, which is what it did. And it would go onto your tongue and it would feel smoother, more luxurious, and a little bit more temperature level. So, all of these would have helped with that. The last one we're going to talk about here that we have available is pectin. I don't think a lot of pectin as a stabilizer. It's okay. And again, it does the same as this. Pectin, naturally occurring chemical in fruit. So when you make jam, what you're doing is you're warming, heating the pectin, which will then bond to the water and thicken it up, create a gel. So that's what happens in jams, jellies, marmalades, and conserves, all that kind of thing, is the pectin is thickening the actual water. And that's the same as agar agar, it's the same as gelatin, it's the same as guar gum, it's the same as xanthan gum, all these kind of things would do that kind of thing as well. But I find pectin, especially powdered stuff, it you know, comes in these little sachets, it dissolves easy enough, but over the course of a couple of weeks in the freezer, it can actually go a bit gritty. So I tend to not use this. I just use it if I'm making a liquid base or add-in for an ice cream. So these are the ones that we've got here at home. We've got some others, commercial ones, that we're not gonna delve into too much today. But something to also remember is some people will say that ice cream is stabilized by sugar. And that is to a degree correct. Sugar will stabilize a lot of the free water and turn it into, you know, if you make um, a syrup, a sugar syrup for various different things, that is stabilized water. You're evaporating some of the water off, you're bonding the sugar molecules into the water molecules and you're stabilizing it. It's the same thing. So if you really don't want to use stabilizers, then my approach would be to increase the sugars slightly to help stabilize some of that free water. The one final thing that I've not brought on here, which I'm just gonna pop down here and get, childproof, love it, milk powder. Uh, milk powder is, is a great stabilizer. It is quite basic in its abilities. It does the same as, as a lot of the viscosity increasing stabilizers. It bonds onto the free water, but it has the, can I sneeze? It has the difference compared to the other two of increasing solids. So milk powder is borderline essential for ice creams. And I, I get really confused when I see people make ice cream and sell it and it doesn't have things like this in or um, CNC or malted dextrin or something. Because if you just use milk and cream and whatever other ingredients you know, you're, you're adding liquid wise along with your sugar, it's very difficult to get your solids where you need them to be. Even in England, where we have 50% fat cream, so double cream, 50% fat. The milk solids is still extremely low. So if you used a standard milk and cream recipe with sugar, let's just say it's vanilla and you add vanilla extract, 
then what you've got is a standard sugar content. Let's let's just say 15%, 16% sugar. You've then got your fat content, which might be 15, 16% fat as well. You've got your solids content that might be somewhere in the 40 range, maybe early 40s, but your milk solids, non-fat milk solids. So you'll see that as in MSNF on a recipe, milk solids, non-fat. They'll be really low. That'll be in a 5% range. And that's too low because you're, you haven't got enough milk protein or, or lactose in there. So the addition of milk powder for dairy-based ice creams is kind of essential. And this is the problem with a lot of vegan recipes is you can't do this. You can't add this. So you have to find another way to add solids to a vegan recipe. You have to ignore the milk solids element because you're using other ingredients. And there are some very, very clever science-based ice cream makers. And we've, we've um, spoken about some of them before. We've done some of their recipes. There is a lovely woman called Chiara who lives in Italy. She specializes. She's an, she is actually a scientific expert on vegan ice cream. So I'll put a link below. She does courses as well. So that might be interesting for you to hit up if you're vegan, if you really want to know about the scientific element of ice cream. It's good to, um, good to learn from multiple people. But she has lots of different things that she adds in to make her gelato. So she doesn't really make American ice cream. She makes gelato. You can't use this. So that's something to consider if you're a vegan and you're making ice cream. The, the final element I'll touch on here is using off the shelf products. You can achieve a decent result. So you can just go out and buy milk, cream, milk powder, sugar, and whatever flavoring you want to use, be it that vanilla or chocolate or whatever, you can combine them without any of these and produce really good ice cream, much better than Ben and & Jerry's and haagen dazs because you're making it there and then it hasn't had that thaw refreeze cycle that a lot of those do as they're being transported. It's made to your desire, your need, you know, you want high sugar, you want low sugar, you can make it as you want it. It will always be better than off the shelf. Always. I guarantee it. But if you want to take it to the next level and you want to make a larger batch, then start looking at stabilizers. Not necessarily that one because you need to use that anyway. The, the final part of this video is what do they do? What stabilizers actually do is allow ice cream to last longer defrost slower, capture free water, and increase viscosity. That's what they do. If you were at home, you've got, let's say you've got a two liter ice cream machine, which is quite big for a home ice cream machine. You make a two liter batch, and in reality, you only eat maybe two or 300 mil, two or 300 grams a week. All of that ice cream is gonna go in a freezer. Every time you open it up, you're increasing the temperature in the freezer. Your ice cream is ever so slightly melting, it's then refreezing, which is increasing the ice crystal size, increasing the air bubble size, and it's actually making the texture worse. And after a month or two, you're literally gonna open the tub and eat a nice old icy chunk of ice cream, and it's not gonna be pleasant. These will help with that. I did a s'mores video last week, released that last week. That had been in for weeks in the freezer due to personal issues in, in filming the actual result. And it was just as good as the day it was made because it was stabilized. So that's what they do. A nice little touch, not too in-depth and scientific as to what they do. There are a couple of website recommendations and that is Dream Scoops. Um, I'll put links to all of these below so you can go and have a, a really good read about what the chemical structure is, how they work together. And you know, it's quite an in-depth subject. You can get really lost into stabilizers if you want to. So you've got dream scoops that talk about it in a reasonable amount of depth. You've got ice cream calc or ice cream calculator, but the website's called ice cream calc. And he goes into a lot of detail about stabilizers as well. You've got underbelly, they talk about ice cream stabilizers. So I'll put links to those below. If this is your kind of thing, and you want to know how to better the mouthfeel of your ice cream and the lasting effects of your ice cream, especially if you're making it commercially, you absolutely should be stabilizing your ice cream. Then head down here, have a look, ask any questions you might have, 
And if you wanna know about commercial stabilizers in depth, then we can do another video about those. But I wanna thank you all for listening to this little video about ice cream stabilizers. Hopefully it's not confused you too much. I tried to keep it as simple as I could. And thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you wanna support the channel, then we have Kofi. I'll put a link below and this is the symbol here. You can head over and offer your support in any way you fancy. It really helps keep the channel going. And we will see you next week.